Good morning, folks. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Hill. It's a pleasure to follow Jim Glassman. Uh, we have a great panel coming on to talk about uh, how the popular vote, national popular vote, would actually work, what behaviors it would change. We have a wonderful panel joining us this morning. Amanda Iovino, I'm going to start in the middle, uh, is senior client strategist with WPA Intelligence. Mark Penn, just to my left, is president of the Stagwell Group, uh, CEO of MDC Partners, and author of Microtrend Squared. And to my far left is Dr. Samuel Wong, founder of the Princeton Election Course Consortium. Thank you all very much for joining us. So we've got a task this morning to have fun with this. We're going to engage in conversation and just you know, create some hypotheticals that if our system were to change, what sorts of behaviors would we see? Now, Mark, you and I have done this a couple of times together. And I was excited because when we were at the Republican convention, I think we, were begin we began talking about different flavors of ice cream. And mm -hmm. you end up with two flavors of ice cream. They have, you know, may, one may be Rocky Road and others. And they said, oh, no, he's moved to uh, fish and chicken. Uh, and I said, well, maybe we can talk about varieties of fish and chicken. But maybe we can talk about how people are going to fish differently. Are they going to fish in, you know, instead of one place or three places, are they going to fish, you know, a broader part of the Chesapeake Bay or something? And said, so now I understand you've moved to potatoes. So we're very excited to hear uh, about the potato analogy. And can you help us set the stage on this topic of if we were to deploy a national popular vote compact, how would you see candidates and behaviors change? Good. I, I thought it would be most useful just to give you an overview of the numbers of the current system and, and how it works and, and how it's been working in, in recent years. And, and that is kind of to help uh, move the discussion along. And you know, look, I was always told uh, by President Clinton, he always liked to have a story people could relate to. And so I like food stories. Mm. Um, you haven't heard. Uh, you, Would you talk like Big Macs with him? <laughs> uh, yeah. You haven't heard my sandwich. Big, the Big Mac my, strategy? Uh, no, mostly the sandwich strategy, uh -huh. that, that an issue sandwich is not the same as an individual policy or the piece of ham in the middle. <laughs> so, but I, uh. I want to give you uh, another concept, and I'll just make sure you can see it, which is I'm going to start out with uh, the couch potato voter. Okay. So what is the couch potato voter? Those are the 94 million Americans who are eligible to vote, but don't vote. And if you look at the biggest problem in the system, the biggest problem in the system is, as that size has grown to be so big, campaigns have changed so that rather than focusing, as I did back in the day when I ran a lot of campaigns, for the swing voters, people instead try to go for the extremes and get just their slice of the couch out. But if everybody voted, the entire couch would vote. And, you know, what would actually happen if the entire couch did vote, right? And so to do that, based on a New York Times analysis by demographics, you won't, you won't really be able to see the, the slide in, in this room. But what difference would it make if everybody really voted in America? And who is left behind? Primarily now, there are, of the 94 million, tremendous numbers of Latinos, obviously, who are not in the political system. They probably, percentage-wise, rank as, as the number one group not voting. But you would be surprised <clears throat> at the huge numbers of downscale voters, and particularly downscale whites, that don't vote, approximately 60 million. So I always caution people who say that they want everyone in America to vote. Uh, if everyone in America did vote, if we had not just kind of a change in the Electoral College, but like a more Australian system where everyone voted, you would be surprised at the change in the composition of the, of, of the electorate and quite possibly the outcome. And most of the people who are on the couch don't really like any of the politicians. They are right now making an affirmative choice, not all, many of them, as I said, a lot of the Latino communities not yet politically organized as fully as they could be. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people, though, in the 94 million who simply don't like any of the politicians. And so they're, they're highly volatile voters uh, when they come in. So you know, if you take a look at the system, again, you see this enormous gap that continues between between <clears throat> the, about approximately 130 million you know, who vote. And the swing voters in the country are, are typically middle-aged, uh, suburban, 
uh, middle class, and, and Ivor is recorded as about 20% of the country. Uh, and then you also have to look at our primary system, because there's a lot of focus on, well, OK, what about the outcome of the election? Well, it turns out that <clears throat> typically not huge numbers of people have voted in primaries in the past, that an average of about 35 million voters, right? If you take the 130 million general election voters and the 226 million actually eligible to vote, the primary system then is being driven on the basis of about 35 million or 17 and a half million on either side. Now we've had some really contested primaries and you can see kind of bumps up so that the, the total gets can get into the 50s, right? And that would still give you like 25 million on each side, right? <clears throat> so when you think about that, when you look at politics by the numbers, we have about 321 million people in the country. Last time I did this slide, might be 330 by now. We have about 226 million people eligible to vote, meaning they meet all the qualifications for voting. We have about 94 million who actually don't vote and therefore are eligible, the couch potato voters. We have 130 million approximately, could be 140 million, in a higher turnout uh, scenario. About 35 million who vote in a primary. About 17 and a half million who vote in each side, which means that in the primary system, it takes about 10 million voters to get the nominee. So that actually about 20 million voters actually are the ones who determine the future for the other 321 million voters when you look at the entire system. So I don't lay this out as a introducer said for a partisan reason, other than I think you should always start out with how is the system working, right? And who's voting? Where does it count? And <clears throat> where is the biggest gap between who votes and the decisions that are made? Thank you. Mark, thanks so much. And we're going to be at this. I should, should have mentioned, I, I also want to say hello not only to all of you in the audience, but we have C-SPAN uh, here, and it's terrific to have them watching. And I'm sure they're going to go kick the tires on all your numbers. And uh, you're going to get lots of mail on whether they think you're right or wrong. Uh, so thank you, Mark. Amanda, before I jump to Dr. Wong, who's going to share presentations, well, I thought I would you know, come at this point for a minute, uh, and you and I had discussed it previously, that if you had a shift to the national popular vote, and you began to sort of imagine that the uh, playbook for running an election would be different, yep. I'm interested in how, what behaviors you would see. And, and I want to mention another uh, Donald Trump quote. Uh, you know, the president, he says, he said, uh, President Trump said, the president, if you go by the college electoral, if you go to the electoral college, that's a marked, uh, that's a very different race, much different race than running a popular vote. It's like the 100 yard dash versus the mile. I actually stole this from a Reed Hunt article in Salon, so it's a great piece of that all of you should take a look at. But in this, he's sort of looking at the different muscles you would essentially use, the different training you would use. And I'm interested, given what Mark said about the couch paper, potato voter, about others that might be brought in, what would you just see as some of the campaign strategy differences that you would deploy? Well, I think because you're talking about a much greater geography, much greater audience size of people that a campaign would need to talk to, um, camp it would cost a lot more for a campaign. And campaigns would then, I mean, it would cost more from a polling standpoint. Suddenly you'd have to be polling in California and New York regularly. Um, it would cost more from a staff standpoint and advertising above everything else. So I wouldn't, given the hard dollar fundraising limits, I don't think campaigns should focus at all on broadcast ads. You would let the super PACs, the dark money groups, kind of take over that aspect of a campaign. And then real, campaigns would look more and more to modeling. At WPA, we're seeing more candidates on all levels. So is that a good thing? I think so, because you can get more individualized. You actually, using modeling, issue modeling, you figure out what individuals really care about, and then the candidates can talk to those individuals on the issues that they care about and mobilize them either to get out to vote or to persuade them on those issues. So right now in North Dakota, which was a case that Jim Glassman raised in terms of the, what was it, 64 percent, Jim, is that the number of people that support this? How would you suspect that a campaign, right now there's not much play in that state, it's not as good as a battleground state, how would it, give me a story that you might see unfold as to how a voter there would weigh more in, in a next election with national popular vote than we have today? 
Um, I think the candidates would actually be looking to poll them and to model what they care about. So if a, they know a voter in North Dakota cares about health care in the same way that a voter in Ohio or Florida does, they can direct those ads to those individuals. Um, and then you, those voters will hear from the candidates about the issues that they really care about. So Dr. Wong, let me jump to you. I know you've got a, a, a few graphs to show us as well, as if you, you know, looking at uh, this time of close elections and looking at different simulated scenarios of how they get resolved in the future, I'm interested in how you see uh, the impact of a national popular vote compact coming on board. Well, first I should say that as a, in addition to founding the Princeton Election Consortium, I'm a laboratory scientist, and I should say that a scientist should not be involved in this, but democracy has gotten complicated, mm. and we have a Baroque mechanism like the Electoral College, it starts to matter. And so what I want to show is basically show some, uh, I'd sol say bugs in the electoral system, unanticipated weaknesses. And so I wanted to show that, if that's okay. Great. And it's C-SPAN, so we get to show slides. Exactly. So this is, this is very, exci this is very exciting for an academic to be able to show visuals. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I teach at Princeton University. I, I run a research laboratory. Um, and I just want to show some uh, real and mythical flaws in the Electoral College, so I, I want to partially debunk. Your bug is wearing my tie. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, so, uh, that's right. I have a cicada here. It's a bug in democracy. Cicadas come to Princeton every uh, 17 years, I believe. Uh, but I want to show you, um, and so therefore we, you know, we like to show cicadas. Um, I want to show some actual flaws in the Electoral College and uh, hope to hopefully replace some false beliefs that some people have. So first, I want to say the reason that we care so much about the Electoral College, this is a graph of the popular margin of whoever became president, going back to John Quincy Adams. And we live in a time of close elections. And the reason we care about this is if you look here below that black horizontal line, there's a time when we have, uh, in the 19th century, during the first Gilded Age, we had racial divisions, technological disruption, uh, increasing inequality, and deep partisanship. And then we had two popular vote losers become president of the United States. Uh, that time perhaps sounds a little familiar to us. We have now a time today where we have racial divisions, technological disruption, increasing inequality, and deep partisanship. And in two out of the last five elections, the person who got more votes did not become president of the United States. And so the reason we're here today, I think, is that there's a lot of interest in that. And really, I want to show you now in the next slide that in close elections, there's a one in three chance that the popular vote winner will not become president. And this can go in either direction. And so this is not really very friendly for television. And so if you want to read more about it, you can read about it at election.princeton.edu. And over at election.princeton.edu, I show that not only with modeling, but also with actual data, taking all this historical data going back through uh, Bush v. Gore, um, uh, uh, Rutherford v. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, uh, if the election is within three percentage points in the popular vote, there's a one in three chance that the popular vote winner will end up not becoming president of the United States. And this is a risk that, that can go in both directions. For instance, if John Kerry had pulled out um, a win in Ohio, he would have become president in 2004. And I think our conversation would have had a slightly different tenor today. So just to emphasize that the risk can go in either direction, uh, and a one in three risk is, I, in my view, a pretty large risk. So there's a belief. I want to talk about this popular belief. There's a belief that if we had a national popular vote, we would end up with a system in which votes on the coasts would end up determining the presidency. Uh, and I just want to show you that this is, in fact, not the case. This is a graph of what fraction of the Hillary Clinton plus Donald Trump vote uh, is won by state and on the horizontal axis. I love saying horizontal axis, very academic and nerdy. But on the horizontal axis, it's the number of states. And you can see here in the lower left corner, California only provides about 7% of, uh, of, of that necessary 50%. You add New York, OK, a little bit more. Add Florida, add Texas, right? So Texas is a state we don't normally think of as supporting, say, the Democratic Party. But Texas would provide some of uh, those votes. And you have to go all the way to 41 states plus the District of Columbia, or for you end up with enough votes to give Hillary Clinton more votes than Donald Trump. And the 42nd voting entity that, gives, uh, that put, puts her over half of the two-party vote is Rhode Island. And so this is a situation in which Rhode Island's votes end up mattering. And so this is very different, I think, from mm -hmm. the popular belief that, um, that, um, that it's really coastal states that will end up providing the votes. I should also emphasize that, uh, that people worry about rural states. Rural voters in California are currently disempowered. Rural voters all over the country are disempowered because they don't matter, because they're not in swing states. So I think there are popular beliefs about what a national popular vote entails. And I just want to really emphasize that those beliefs are really not correct at all. Now, this is, uh, again, something perhaps that people haven't thought of. 
Um, foreign interference in elections is very much on people's minds these days, right? It's, it's right at the front of the news. Uh, it, you can't avoid it anymore. Um, and uh, having just a few swing states, having, state, having the election decided in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, uh, maybe this year, it'll, you know, next year, it'll, maybe it'll be Arizona, Michigan, uh, wherever it might be, that opens up a vulnerability to hacking. And the reason for that is that if a national popular vote can have a vote margin that's in the hundreds of thousands or the millions. But if we have a really close election, the number of votes that uh, need to be flipped in order to alter the outcome is much smaller. So on the right side, the big bars in this graph are the popular vote margin for Trump v. Clinton, Bush v. Kerry, Bush v. Gore, Carter versus Ford, Nixon versus Humphrey, for those of you who remember that sort of thing, uh, and Kennedy versus Nixon. We're kind of going back in time here. Think of it. Uh, these are elections where tens of thousands of votes to millions of votes would be, need to be flipped in order to alter the outcome of the presidential election. But if you use electoral college mechanisms, look, it's, it's well known. It only took a few hundred votes in Florida to, to, alter, to determine the election of uh, George W. Bush versus Al Gore. Similarly, Bush v. Kerry, John Kerry could have pulled that out with 80,000 votes in Ohio. And so this is a pretty significant security risk. If we are concerned about foreign interference in our elections, then we have opened up a giant security hole by not having a simpler system. So it's not just a nerdy thing where you know, we run our models and it's fun to talk about strategy or you know, we worry about battleground states. All those are critical issues. In addition to all of that, there's a security risk that's staring us in the face. And it would seem like a good idea to address that security risk. And so I just want to say that a popular vote mismatch can happen in one out of three close elections. The Electoral College. Uh, doesn't favor broad coalitions, it favors battleground states. And finally, I just want to reemphasize that there's a security risk that we have to be concerned about when thinking about this. And Teddy Roosevelt uh, said that, of course, a majority, is, uh, uh, a majority rule is the core, con core value of our election system. Uh, and he was a Republican, and so you know, uh, one can imagine that Republicans might have an interest in, uh, in running a national campaign as well. And Dr. Wan, as you're in an academic in, in Princeton looking at this, I'm sure you've looked at the other argument as well. And I know, uh, you know folks out there right now are making a, a big defense of the Electoral College. And so I'm interested in if, if um, you had someone across the hall at Princeton who was your you know, big time rival, uh, and he or she were making a defense of the Electoral College along similar lines, is there such a defense that's plausible? Um, or do you think that the Electoral College, as we've seen now, and the behavior is just simply an anachronistic uh, uh, part of the system that either needs to be worked around, amended, tied up in a compact. I mean, is there any strength of, of argument that you found in your academic role on the other side of preserving things as they are? Well, cognitive scientists and also economists have a thing called loss aversion, where if you have a thing, you tend to treasure it and be unwilling to give it up. And so people are good at coming up with reasons why the current system is good. And, and they're motivated to come up with the reasons. So, for example, I already mentioned one, uh, rural voters. Uh, the idea is somehow that rural voters would be disempowered, but there are currently tens of millions of voters who are disempowered. So that would be one reason that's offered. Another is protection of small states. Uh, small states currently don't get visited. And so these are common reasons that are given for, uh, for preserving the Electoral College. But currently, I would say that people in small population states get ignored. Uh, some of the most powerful voters in the country are in Pennsylvania, across the river from where I live in New Jersey. Mm. And those voters, whether they're in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or in Bucks County, have thousands of times the power that I do in New Jersey. And those are not rural voters. And so I would say that, that there are ideas that get kicked around as to why the Electoral College is useful um, and a good thing. Uh, but it turns out they don't really work out in practice. And so I, you know, I think it would be a robust discussion, but one would um, want to Mark, if, if President Trump called you and said, hey, there's this guy, Dr. Wong, out there who's you know, defending this new national popular vote idea, how would you turn it on its head? Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I'd say I'd hang up the phone first. Uh, <laughs> no, they, I think that you've got to, I think you've got to, um, when you look at the national, let me just go back to the argument, the national popular vote versus the electoral college vote. What I want to make sure is that a majority of Americans actually vote for whoever's president. Mm -hmm. So I think that the compact sounds interesting, but you, you have to be careful that in a parliamentary system, which we don't have, if people vote for one of various parties, those votes would get aggregated to create a coalition. So if you don't have a runoff requirement in the switch, look, I. 
I think it's hard to defend necessarily the Electoral College that was established 200 years ago for the concerns that, that were at that time. Today, the concern primarily is not the popular vote winner, because uh, Bill Clinton won the popular vote in 1992, but that's because Ross Perot split off conservative voters by two to one. If a liberal candidate came in and split the Democratic vote so that the popular vote winner was then uh, the Republican, everyone would be just as upset about the system as they are about the Electoral College. So to me, it's very important that if you make a switch, that you have a runoff provision, because in a non-parliamentary system, then a lot of voters would be disenfranchised, and the mix of the candidates would determine the winner, rather than requiring the dropout of the minor candidates. And then a lot of people are putting in, hey, we should put in ranked voting as a solution to that. But ranked voting is actually not the same as forcing people one-on-one -on -one to have a campaign and let the voters decide. So uh, I think that system, where the, where the popular vote winner actually won a majority of the votes, I think that probably strengthen our system tremendously and also eliminate a lot of the, the flukes which would, would come in, which I'm more worried about, which is that people would game out the system to get minor candidates in to carve off different constituencies to tip the winner to somebody else. Well, if you look in the last five elections, I think if I recall correctly, uh, or going out seven elections, uh, it's happened over and over again that neither candidate has gotten over 50% of the votes cast, which is your point. Uh, and that illustrates the value of having local reform, places like Maine that have uh, ranked choice voting. So I think that uh, this is a good point. Uh, I think it's a little bit different from the point of um, the distortions that the Electoral College imposes, but it is something that needs to be addressed to, uh, to repair democracy. I'm very interested in this North Dakota poll because it's rare that we get a snapshot of a state, uh, particularly a red state, in these circumstances we're in right now, and in the popularity of this sort of approach. I know uh, fam my family's from Oklahoma, uh, and Oklahoma has been also wrestling with this. I think the effort there was sort of caught in the house, but there's also a, a strong degree of support in Oklahoma, another red state in this. But Amanda, you have chatted with me a little bit about how other elements of the chessboard would change, how primaries would change in states, how parties themselves would have to change. So can you give us some insight into the other actors in the stage, other than maybe just the citizen and the vote in that dimension, but how other features of our political system would go through a transformation? Well, I think in the medium term, the primary system would have to change. Right now it goes state by state, it reflects the electoral college, and I think after a cycle or two, the primaries would start, to, the parties would change the primaries to better reflect what actually happens in a general election. Um, but I think more immediately what would change is the way that parties distribute their money. Um, in 2016, California only got about $36,000 from the RNC. In the years since, they've gotten the same amount of money. $36,000? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 36000 That yes. wasn't a mistake. Nope. Yeah. Where did it, where, where did it go? <laughs> uh, that I'm not sure. But since then, California and Mississippi have gotten roughly the same amount of money from the RNC. New York and West Virginia are also about equal. So you would see those balances change, which I think would have um, a down ballot effect because once the turnout operations in New York and California on the right start to improve, you would see a lot more candidates, quality candidates, especially women candidates, come out of the woodwork. Women candidates are not necessarily risk adverse, they are risk aware. Um, and they look around and they look for systems in place to help them. So on the left, you had Emily's List around for 30 years, providing financial support, moral support, political support. Um, and you're seeing more and more women on the left step up. I was recently at Winning for Women, and once that organization has gotten started, providing financial support, moral support, and with the launch of their super PAC, political support uh, for women on the right, they're seeing more women step out um, and run for office than ever before. So once these systems, once women know that the turnout efforts are going to be in place in bluer states, um, more women on the right will also step up. So let me it. ask you, um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this gently and, and, and without uh, frustrating too many folks that are listening. One of the groups that feels aggrieved right now, I remember uh, interviewing Vice President Biden before the uh, Clinton-Trump race, and he said the Democratic Party had become a party of snobs. And so the issue, particularly of white working class men, 
uh, have been part of the election story that we've seen, their anger, their frustration. Is there a way that their interests get addressed in this, or do they get knocked to the side in this kind of transition? Um, I think to Mark's point earlier, I think you might be better to speak to this. Most of those voters that would, the couch potato voters are white men, and they would come out. Uh, so they, they would, they would, yeah, so <laughs> back to the couch potato, Mark. Um, well, who is the couch potato exactly? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. part of this too, if you're fixing the system, yeah. should we have voluntary voting versus mandatory voting like in Australia? Mm. See, part of the problem is that turnout- That's a whole has, nother conference. Well, yeah. we'll do the next one, make, yeah. make every yeah. vote vote and count, <laughs> right? Would be that conference, right. but, but I do think that right now, the campaigns have so much money that they've stopped going after swing voters. Part of the reason that the country's so divided is when you run a campaign for swing voters, mm. right, then you're always trying to attract those people who don't agree with you. And if you win, a lot of those people then unify the country. Say Obama in 2008, I think, successfully did that in his campaign. But when you run these campaigns just to get your people off the couch, mm. right, and because campaigns have so much more money to do that now, whether you're, not, you're in the electoral college or I think in the, in the national vote situation, if you're just getting your people off the couch, then you're dividing the country. And then whoever wins just has his or her half of the country supporting them because they never really appeal to the other half. So I want to see whatever system, I'd much rather see everybody uh, have to vote, eliminate turnout, uh, up the turnout in the primaries, and, then, and that would be, a re and require 50%. And that'd be a real democracy, mm. right? And if we're gonna change things, change everything. Dr. Wan, do you agree with Mark? I think that changing everything would be great. Uh, I think if we tr start by changing some things, that would be good. So turnout is higher in battleground states than in other states. Uh, we've mentioned a lot of states. Amanda has mentioned states like West Virginia. Neither candidate visited West Virginia in 2016. Neither candidate in the general election campaign visited California and New York. Do you know the so, other weird thing, not to interrupt you, yeah. that it's just, but I'm going to. Uh, uh, there's this thing I was reading uh, just, just last night about emergency declarations, presidential emergency declarations, are greater in battleground states than non-battleground states. So you have decisions on providing government resources to help uh, folks in times of duress and national emergency uh, that also follow and, and, and correlate with the same Battleground state yeah, phenomenon. usually you would, you would like our presidents to uh, not be moved by perverse incentives like looking after battleground states, but, it, uh, but sometimes we see a circumstance in which the president is not always motivated by serving the entire nation, <laughs> consciously or unconsciously, and in those circumstances, it's important to have mechanisms that create good incentives to make them want to look after California, or West Virginia, or Alabama, or Mississippi. And uh, that's something that is, um, that you would not normally expect, but it, you know, democracy mostly works until it doesn't, and these norms of looking mm -hmm. after the entire country start falling apart, and when they fall apart, then we start noticing that there's something that served us well as a nation for a long time, and now we see that there are reasons why it would be better to fix it, and I think that we're seeing in modern times a lot of motivation to fix democracy, and hopefully in the next decade or so, uh, I mean, just to be realistic, in the next decade or so, we can maybe set up a situation in which we're a little bit calmer than we are today and this year uh, and start thinking about building a democracy that's going to last another several hundred years. What is your sense, uh, all of you, but, but Dr. Wall, I'll ask you this first, of the uh, enthusiasm or lack thereof for uh, a national, national popular vote construct? I, I had gotten to know Mick Cornett, who was the former mayor of Oklahoma City. He ran for uh, governor and lost in Oklahoma. Very interesting guy, for those of you who haven't heard of Mick, was a guy who <laughs> was very happy that Oklahoma City was on the front cover of lots of magazines uh, for being one of the fastest growing economies in, this, in the country, but it was also in a lot of magazines as being the most obese uh, city in the country, or one of them. And he got about 40,000 people within the greater Oklahoma City area to collective, to go online, build community, build work with each other, and they collectively lost a million pounds in weight. It's a very powerful story, and then it began to get people engaged with uh, changing infrastructure decisions on walkability and stuff. Mick's written a book about second-tier cities and about the great innovations in second-tier cities around the country, these second-level country, you know, and these cities are the ones, in part, not just the cities, but also the rural areas, are the ones that we're talking about in a way that are often the left-behinds. And I uh, had mentioned to him that we're doing this, and there is an enthusiasm that he would have, he's again an Oklahoman, 
uh, in this sort of construct. And I'm wondering, you know, as you look across the country, where have you seen enthusiasm for this idea? Well, just imagine, as I was saying before, rural voters in California are currently disempowered. But as you say, city voters in places like Oklahoma, Texas, uh, you know, Nebraska, right? These are places where those voters are disempowered. One example that's kind of interesting is that there's polling data right now that shows um, uh, the leading Democrat in the nomination at the moment is Joe Biden, and he leads uh, um, Donald Trump by nine points in Ohio. And, uh, and that would m actually motivate, I think, Ohio residents, at least the Republican voters, to think again about whether they really like having so much power that they currently have. I think that overall, voters in any state eventually will come into a, a circumstance where they might have some reason to, uh, to have their vote count once and always count. And that's a circumstance we don't have at the moment. Amanda, how about in your sense of the infrastructure, political infrastructure out there, and the, and the enthusiasm or lack thereof for this Well, I think concept? generally people will be enthusiastic about it until they start getting bombarded with ads and phone calls and door knocking. Well, but it's hard to get bombarded. <laughs> I mean, imagine a poor voter in New, New Hampshire or Ohio. Yeah, it must be god-awful to just have ads all the time. <laughs> It would, be hard, it would be hard to have that level to of even out the wave, right? Even yeah, but, out be the, nice, yeah. but it would create messaging that would be not targeting a blue state or a red state, but the entire nation. And I think that would probably uh, work, tend to work against message division. And message division and alternate facts seem to be a significant problem right now in, in U.S. democracy. But you'd also have a higher reliance on social media to spread the message to as many people as possible. And we've seen how social media can distort even little nuggets of fact or, or fiction. Yes, that would be an important <laughs> Mark? problem to fix. <laughs> I, I think, look, in general, I don't think it's a state-by-state state thing. I, I think nationally, if I ask a poll question, would you like to move to the national popular vote? I think the concept is quite popular, uh, generally speaking. And I don't think it's, a, it's limited to, that's why the, mm. the, the, the poll from a red state doesn't really surprise me. But the, the, the point that I'm making, and I'll, and, and, I'll, and I'll keep hitting on, that when they say a national popular vote, they don't mean just a partial change that could make the system worse. They don't mean, you know, if you go back to 2016, for example, mm. and I add up the, take out the libertarian vote, and take out the Jill Stein vote, and I look at the national congressional vote, add up all the districts in which everyone voted Democrat or Republican, the national vote was not 49% Republican, 48% Democratic, right? And so what's the national popular vote, right? And how do you count it? It's critically important to the fairness. Look, the other thing I think you have to realize is a lot of the battleground states, surprisingly, have some of the biggest economic problems. Is that a chicken or egg, mm -hmm. right? Are they a battleground state because they have economic problems? Or do they have economic problems before they're, because they're a battleground state? I suggest it's probably the, the former. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, I wouldn't take battleground states as a fixed concept. Through American history, politics changes far more than you ever expect. And the battleground states today are the battleground states today precisely because you know, the half the electorate that voted for Donald Trump lives on a third of the GDP, or the almost half. Uh, as opposed to the almost half that voted for Hillary live on two-thirds of the GDP. This underlying economics really has created the, the power of the change of the battleground states. And I think whether or not you have a, popular, a fair national popular vote system or an electoral <laughs> college system, those trends, who's been a winner and who's been a loser, will still be the dominant ones in this election or in any election. Thank you for that. Let me ask you all a question, Dr. Wine. You were talking about the safety and security, the solvency of the elections, the ability that outsiders could meddle. It occurred to me when you were saying that there, that there are internal meddlers that people don't like as well, that there are special interest groups uh, that can bring pressure to bear. So, Amanda, let me ask you first, how, how does the, the behavior of interest groups change in this, in this model? Does, it get, does life get better or worse for them? I think it's just different, not necessarily better or worse. They're going to focus instead of focusing their efforts on battleground states, they'll go to where the persuadable voters are. Um, well, let's, let's I, take, for example, the national, let's, let's imagine a real National Rifle Association, like real hot issue, guns, right? So we have, you know, the guns debate is very much a key uh, uh, part of the electoral game going on right now. How would the NRA's bets that it made shift? Well, they would look, I would suggest to them to do some national modeling 
figure out where their Second Amendment voters are and then drive up turnout among those those members uh, and those voters and whether that is in Ohio and Virginia or if it's in Tennessee and Kentucky and Oklahoma, that's where they will focus their efforts to drive up those And you make numbers. the same thing with, say, defenders of the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Yep. Uh, you can have these trans-state uh, exactly. alliances, if you will. Do you agree, Dr. Wong? Well, I think that one thing that comes up is um, election integrity. So right now, to be honest, it probably doesn't matter if there are a few miscounted votes in North Dakota, but it would matter much more if we had a national system for counting votes. And so I think that one area that would need attention in a truly national system would be vote protection uh, in places such as, not only places where we hear about it a lot, like Georgia, but also places like North Dakota, Wyoming, uh, all these states. So I think that poll watchers might end up being important, election integrity may end up being important. Uh, to your point, um, yeah, issue, uh, issue organizations would also have to address this, these things as well. well Mark? I, look, <clears throat> it's an interesting debate between the two of you because is, is a national election going to become more local and targeted, or is it going to become more governed by national media, right? So, well, we have statewide elections all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And how are statewide elections governed? The truth is, I, I, there'll be room for both, and there'll be room for campaign strategies, and depending upon who you are and your ability to get national media versus what kind of cause you represent, your ability then to, to stir turnout. I don't actually think there'll be one, one formula. I do think that you know, if, there, if there ever were a genuinely close national election, that that would be a security nightmare. Because in, in running counter to the argument you've made, at least now election security is relatively important just in a handful of states. And so you can defend the integrity in those states. If you had a nationally close election, within, well, let's say, 100,000 votes, people could find 100,000 votes, wow, in probably 50 or 60 different counties mm. in America. And you could have 50 or 60 different uh, battles going on. I've got 25,000 votes here. I've got 5,000 here. I've got another 10,000 ballots coming in absentee. I've got, that's something that the country and the Supreme Court could never recover from if, if there isn't adequate security before that happens. And especially in the first year, when you have no idea what turnout is going to be, the, the opportunity for foreign actors to come in, change a couple of votes in California, a couple in Alabama, knowing that those jurisdictions aren't going to necessarily talk to each other and say, hey, I've noticed this kind of irregularity, mm -hmm. did you? Um, there's more opportunity for, for that interference. I'm going to push back a little bit. Election officials I've met are pretty hardworking and they're pretty honest and they're concerned about these things. And if we put an incentive structure in place to keep elections clean, I think that those people are gonna step up. And I think, I'm, I see the point, uh, but I think that it illustrates more of a point to increase election security beyond what it is now. There are some pretty hardworking people in the 3,000 jurisdictions across the United States that run elections. And we should maybe uh, think of them as, I don't know, Americans who are gonna in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to go to the audience, so get your best questions going. But you know, it occurs to me, I looked at the uh, states that are, that are now uh, committed to the National Popular Vote Compact. We have you know, the District of Columbia, Maryland, New Jersey, Illinois, Hawaii, Washington, Massachusetts, Vermont, California, Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, Colorado, Delaware, New Mexico, and Oregon. And uh, I'm reading the ones off Wikipedia, so hopefully those are right, uh, folks. Uh, did I miss anyone? Pretty much in that in that fast, 196 electoral college votes covered by this vote. So to me, not knowing anything that these folks have gone through in terms of the struggle, 74 more seems easy. Uh, is it, Mark? Oh, I I can tell you whether. <coughs> I mean, do you? I, I do think you, it's pretty. You know, look, I don't know whether the Supreme Court would sanction the effort this way. Mm. Look, I be, I I do believe we have a process for change. I do believe that that. 200 years later, it makes sense for us to sit down and say, hey, does this electoral college make as much sense as a full national voting system with runoffs, with maybe everybody voting, with national registration, with primaries that have more people? To really fix the system, I think we should do it the right way. But aren't they doing it the right way in the sense that states get to make these choices? Isn't this a state-based decision and a state-based no, compact? No, states don't get to. You can't be for a national popular vote and say you want a couple of state legislatures to decide our system. Mm. By, by the definition, you want it decided democracy, by through mm. democracy. 
Well, I believe the National Popular Vote Compact is an agreement that requires 270 electoral votes worth of states to agree. Right. And in order to get that 74, I think it's obvious that at some point you would need to either get purple states or red states on board. And so one question we could ask is, what would be the right conditions to get people thinking that way? You know, one obvious way that could happen would be if the popular vote, electoral vote split goes in the opposite direction, as it almost did in 2004. Another would be to appeal to people's sense of good government, that, mm. uh, that the candidate who gets more votes should become president. So this is obviously a tough lift right now when we're under conditions of close national division. Uh, and I think it'll take, it's a, it's a years long project, maybe a pretty long project to get over 270. All these other concerns I think are quite important, uh, but one needs to be in it for the distance. Amanda, thoughts? I agree with Mark. I think if you're going to do this, it should be done the right way at the end of the day. I think this is a very interesting way to work out all of the kinks and talk about the, the problems that could potentially come in, but at the end of the day, I think it needs to be a full democratic process. I was reading an article in this morning, reading the very last paragraph, the kicker of it, in National Affairs, I wanted to familiarize myself with the strongest defense of the Electoral College uh, as it was, and people looked at history and small states and, and, and kind of looking at the legacy of uh, uh, slavery as an issue in America. It's a very interesting story, but, but the, the kicker, if I can read it here, is if anything, the Electoral College was designed to act as a break on overmighty presidents who might use a popular majority to claim that they were authorized to speak for the people against Congress, and from that we may well have a lot more to fear uh, than from the Electoral College. I find that very interesting because we may, we may have an overmighty pr presidential situation uh, that isn't using uh, a popular vote as the mandate, but is in fact turning to the Electoral College and that as a way to justify where he's at. Any thoughts on this, Mark? Well, everybody, yeah. everybody turns to the Electoral College. When Bill Clinton got 41%, mm. he turned to the Electoral College. The Electoral College is the system we have. And so everybody's going to look right now. Every campaign and campaign strategist should be playing to the Electoral College. And if anything, it was a huge oversight not believing that so many blue states could change. Hmm. And this is why I keep saying whatever you think is going to happen in American politics, and if you think that the system is going to work to your advantage, you know, uh, uh, both parties have proven over the long run, even after 49 state wipeouts. They come back, and politics changes, economics changes, issues change. We need the fairest system we can have for today. And I think that kind of message, like a lot of the reforms that I think aren't talked about on the stump, will really resonate powerfully. And I think that could be really bipartisan. I don't think that has to be a partisan issue. Steve, what you mm -hmm. read is from around 1800. If we think about what the original founders wanted, sure, they maybe wanted a, a deliberate Well, no, program. this was written more recently, but. Okay, but I'm yeah. just gonna point out that when we refer to what the founders wanted or what the original right. goal of, of holding back a mob or what have you, there are 40 years of additional things that happen after the founders did their work, winner take all elections, mm. right? And then we have enfranchisement of, uh, of the freeing of, of slaves, uh, women getting the vote. All these things have happened. And so the Electoral College idea where there's mm. like these dudes and wigs like discussing how democracy ought to work. There's a lot of overlay on top of that, and it is a mistake to imagine that somehow, and I hate to burst the bubble here, but we don't have a deliberative electoral college at the moment, mm -hmm. right? Like they do their jobs, and their job is to vote the way their citizens told them to. And so I think that one should be a little bit clear-eyed about what the electoral college actually does now. It doesn't actually hold back a, a majoritarian president who claims mob rule. Right, or claims the support of the mob. So this, I think that one, a little is realism the, is in order. This is the perfect tension to go to the audience with. Right. So thank you, thank you all very much here. Uh, let me go to, the, to, to all of you. Where is uh, Steve Schafferman? Uh, I was gonna offer him. No, you're not gonna, okay, let me go to Walt Slocum in the back. Walt? Uh, let me, we've got a microphone. We have C-SPAN going here, Walt, so say your greetings to C-SPAN and give them your uh, Twitter address. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Great, great question. Mark? No, 
<coughs> Does targeted suppression increase or decrease? Well, uh, you know, look, registration is a very complicated issue because some states have a whole set of yeah. requirements for registration. You know, other, other states make it, make it easy to register. You know, that's why what I did was, was look at the difference. You know, if I were to do, I think there's, you know, of registered voters. In registered voters in swing states now, turnout is quite high, like over 75%, I think. And then it's much lower where there aren't contested elections. And a national election probably would, would I think, as, as everyone has said, probably change, change that a lot. But I think the registration system's broken too. I mean, all of these different registration systems, and, and really, I, we get a social security card you know, from birth or from citizenship, and having the same process so that we really could have national registration, I think would make a tremendous difference in the system. Look, my, my point is every single aspect of our system, from the antiquated electoral college that doesn't meet with a bunch of elders to prevent the popular will, down to primaries where getting 10 million votes really determines one of the only two flavors of ice cream you'll be able to choose. My point is you've got to change this whole system and, and reconfigure it for the 21st century so that it gives everyone a level playing field and a chance to get a majority vote in this country. Amanda, your strategies in this too, do you have thoughts on, on both recruitment and repression tactics? Um, I I think that it's going to be in different locations more than it necessarily being more or less overall. Instead of focusing, again, on the battleground states, it's going to focus on battleground counties or battleground precincts. And it's not necessarily more or less, it's just different locations. Thank you. Let me uh, go Joe Friedman here in front. Right here in front. My name is Joe Freeman. I have been working on campaigns and doing Get Out the Vote since 1952. You're looking and, good, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Not walking as well, but yeah. Good. Um, I'd like to tell you about the two things which my experience has taught me are the most important for increasing turnout, and then ask mm -hmm. why you didn't mention them. The short them. form. Well, why you didn't mention them. Mm. One is excitement, just general election excitement. In the 50s and 60s, election day was a little like Christmas. Now it's more like mm -hmm. Veterans Day. Um, so how do you increase excitement? Second question is, you never mentioned precinct workers. And I've worked precincts mm. in at least a dozen different states. I can make a difference. I can make a difference not only in the number of people I turn out. I've done mm. comparison of precincts, which I worked, which ones which weren't worked. But more importantly, I can make a dif difference in the down ballot. Uh, people won't vote right. the way I tell them to vote for president, but they sure will for civil court judge. Mm. So um, I'd like Great. to comment Thank on you. that. So, so again, other features of the system. Amanda, do you want to excitement and precinct workers? I think excitement comes from, frankly, the candidates, especially at the top of the ticket. If people are excited for or they're excited to vote against someone, that the candidates themselves are the ones that really drive that excitement more than the, the process and the institution. Um, as far as precinct workers, I, they do a fantastic job, um, and every precinct worker <laughs> that I've known um, does amazing work. I don't think that there are enough of them, um, especially to function in a national popular vote system where in a lot of places you only have, you only need one party represented as a precinct worker, all of a sudden you're gonna to need to double those, those workers uh, overall. It's gonna be doesn't, hard. I mean, doesn't by definition excitement increase if you feel like your vote does count? In the name itself of today of, of, the, of the organization, Make Every Vote Counts. I live in a house, house on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and I, I can tell you there are lots and lots of people I know regrettably out there who, who feel in that circumstance their vote doesn't count, so they don't, they don't vote. But I think if you had a system where their vote did count and they were able to weigh, they, the excitement would increase. Is that, is that a, does that make sense, Mark? Yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I think you're definitely right. Whether or not it will make a net difference, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, uh, because you saw a tremendous increase well, it gets a net turnout. difference in what you cared about, which was a more genuine democracy. Correct. Yeah. I, think, I think it makes a, but it makes a real difference. I completely agree with you. In a national election, everyone will feel the equal tension to get out and vote or not. And just to, we, we've come uh, from a system that was in the, in the 50s driven primarily by organization to one that was then driven by mass media, which is now going back to being driven by organization. So the, whether it will be the physical precinct worker or the online 
physics worker and organizer, we are back to a much more organization, people to uh, people to people political system. And I would say about excitement, the, the most depressing thing to me is that the campaign ads now are about in a presidential campaign about ninety percent negative, and that. Negative campaigns are always supposed to depress turnout, and instead they've been driving turnout up. Uh, and so I would, and you know, we are in what I call a 40-40-20 country, in which the 20% of swing voters don't like either candidate, either party, or anyone. And so we're in a very negative environment. I'd like to see it driven by the kind of positive excitement that was really driving turnout. Uh, that's just not what we have right now. Dr. Wong, thoughts on those two? One thought I have is if we're talking about campaign mobilization in the 1950s, that goes back to an era when elections were not as close at a national level. Mm. And what that means is that it probably has something to do with the fact that, in fact, there was more excitement at the local level. Because if the thing that you can affect is your local race, right, then that would, that would affect turnout. And that would affect the kinds of messages that become effective. And so I think that we're in this unusual time when these national elections have, are the shiny object that capture our eyes. Uh, and if we're going to build something that works in the long term, we should, in fact, think about the fact that sometimes local elections mattered. Like, if you know, the, the, the question uh, was predicated on running campaigns going back to 1952. Uh, no offense to the memory of Adlai Stevenson, but those were not terribly close presidential races. And so, but there was excitement, and there was, as you say, there was excitement at the local level. And so I think we need to look beyond what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years and think about building something that's going to work when we get away from the current level of polarization. Right, that's why I think about this is interesting. If you could simulate this thing where you basically have a different sense of, of, of tangibility, of, of feeling like people are involved. Uh, Esther Lee. Hi, Mark. I, I agree with you. Let's change everything. Does but that you include... used to work for him, so that's unfair. You, you, don't, you don't have to be nice anymore. <laughs> no, Go ahead. Be nice. yeah. Does that include giving people the day off? Because that happens in other countries. That's one. Two, can you talk about whether the national popular vote, how it would affect uh, candidates of color, as you know, we have people of color in different pockets of America, and so presumably that could help. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. Mm, great, and we're gonna go to this gentleman right afterward too, so don't go too far away, Andrew. And yeah, we'll, we'll hit lots of you a second. Uh, day off for voting and uh, candidates, of color. candidates of color. Well, day off or move voting to an entire weekend. Yeah, move right? voting, because people have to work for a living. <laughs> people have to work for a living. Like, you give, mm. like not everyone is gonna get Tuesday off. Right. If you want to get people involved who don't make a ton of money, you better give them a time to vote that doesn't take away money from them. Okay, so weekend voting, that's yet another conference you have to, uh, in yeah, the future. You have to do the whole uh, candidates of color, Amanda? Doing weekend voting would be a problem in places like Las Vegas or in, in mm. the hospitality industry. But giving people the time to take off, um, no matter what day, election day is, um, is probably... Amanda, okay. you mentioned women, uh, yeah. and you, you would particularly benefit this, but, but to the question of candidates of color, quick thoughts? Um, I think it's the same. It's very similar. Once they see the systems in place to help them, especially in areas that um, they haven't seen that support before, it will encourage more quality candidates to run instead of ones that are just doing it mm -hmm. either to boost their name ID or just for fun. Great, right here. Can I just add, if you were going to redo the voting system in the 21st century, you would get rid of polling precincts altogether. You would create a whole new voting system that was secure, that was personal, that was individual. That is, that you I don't vote have to keep couch. doing everything that we did 200 years ago. So we could have couch voting for the couch yes, potatoes. Have, yes. Uh, <laughs> get them off yes, the right couch. here, and then over here in the middle, yes. Two seem to say that we should do it the quote-unquote right way, meaning a constitutional amendment. But that's you know two thirds of the states and or, or or Congress and then three quarters of the states. So I mean that's just not realistic. Mm. So uh, so we are in the second best world if you really do want to change everything. Yeah. And we are in this world of of what do we do given mm -hmm. that that given how unlikely that is. So I'm curious. Great. What your response we'll get a quick answer then, and then right here in the middle. Yes, following up on that, um, you all may remember that our senators used to be elected by their state um, uh, legislatures, and that was so successful that a number of states never had any senators in Washington uh, because the legislatures couldn't agree. And so each state changed their uh, process for how they elected 
uh, senators over time, and by the time I believe it was 1923 when it was finally passed, uh, on the national basis, something like three-fourths of the states had already passed it. Mm. And that would argue, honestly, for not making sure that the, uh, that the perfect doesn't get in the way of the good. And we have, you know, uh, 196 votes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, electoral votes already, and if you get that incrementally, you know, in maybe five, ten years after that process has in fact worked, some right. of the other issues that we're talking about today would be addressed at the same time. Thank you. Uh, let me just get, get a couple here. But, uh, Andrew, get, we get this um, person right here, and then uh, we'll take this gentleman in the back, and then I'll have you all uh, respond. Hi. Sangeeta Sigdal from Fairvote. Um, I was curious to hear the panel's thinking around how Maine using ranked choice voting for presidential you know, general election and NPV would interact with each other, whether it would mm -hmm. make it easier or harder. Great, thank you. And why don't we, and then we'll take this last gentleman here and then close out. Are these mics not working? Uh, okay, okay, great. I uh, just wanted to jump off of the, on ranked choice voting. Uh, Mark, you especially said uh, we have to make sure we have a runoff. We have to, you know, we have to really reassess the whole situation. You talked about negative campaigning, excitement, all these things, which ranked choice voting has an effect on and would um, allow people to vote for third parties and allow all that thing and still have right. their voice heard. Um, but then you, yeah, you were against it, or at least you, you. You were saying it's not really the right system. I, I guess I'm curious what your thoughts are, so just to jump So off great, that. so we've got a couple of questions on ranked choice voting. Um, a question about sort of other institutions and having 196 and sort of how we've evolved from senators not even being uh, uh, properly voted and a constitutional amendment uh, strategy that, that seems to be too far, too difficult, too high. Mark? Uh, I'll, I'll just take two, two of those. One is if you're going to change the entire system on how people are elected, you need more than just, even if you could get, and you might get, to 270, more than a number of legislatures who just get over the finish line. Mm. You do need a national consensus, a bipartisan process, and I do think there are so many things that need fixing that I worry that if you change one thing and you get the result that I've suggested, which is you get a, a, a liberal candidate who splits the Democratic vote and the popular vote winner is the Republican with 40%, that then there will be a, 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 a just as much discontent over the new system, because you really need to change a host of things. And I do think the most important thing is, in a non-parliamentary system, uh, I don't think that, that ranked voting enables people to make a fully fleshed out decision between the final choices where the campaigns go at it one-on-one -on -one and make their final argument. And that ranked choice voting is, is incredibly confusing for the voter, and I don't think is, we'll, we might as well go to a parliamentary system if you want to do that. I, think that I, I don't think it's as good as a runoff where the arguments are joined and people get to listen to the final right. two. That's what I think. Amanda? Uh, I, I agree. I think the constitutional amendment is hard but because it's supposed to be hard. Um, it's supposed to be hard to get that sheer number of people in those number of states behind an idea so that you have a mandate for the change in the institution among the entire country. Um, and I also agree on the ranked, voice, uh, ranked vote. Um, I'd rather just go to a runoff after runoff. <laughs> Run after runoff. Uh, I, I really like ranked choice voting, but, but that's indifferent to the conversation here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I, I like diversity and fun and different approaches. But Dr. So think, Wong, final I think thoughts? there's a common theme to all these questions, which is that in a time of national paralysis, whether it be about the Constitution or about passing federal laws, it would be a good time for people to pursue their inner federalists. Think about the election of senators. Mm. As the questioner asked, that beca began locally. Women getting the right to vote also b began locally as a state-by-state -state agenda. And so I think, broadly speaking, in a time when our democracy is in a bit of trouble, when there is a chance to address these questions at a local level, whether it be at a city level, a county level, or a state level, it would be a good time for those of us who are interested in voting rights to really embrace our inner federalist and think about exactly how to fix these things 
state by state. And so I think that to the extent possible, whether it be ranked choice voting or any experiment, it might be a good idea to start using these laboratories of democracy where there's actually a possibility of getting some kind of positive change. Well, I think it's been a very rich discussion. I appreciate all of your candor and sort of thinking about how strategies and campaign behavior would change. I often, uh, when I think about things, think about Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which is just north of Tulsa, and how the engagement, the excitement, the participation uh, uh, of people would change there because there was a, there, there, there is frustration uh, even in uh, uh, red states like uh, uh, Oklahoma on this, and I find it very, very interesting. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Samuel Wong, Amanda Iovino, and Mark Penn. Very rich discussion. Thank you all very much. Jim? We're going to take a we're going to take a 15 minute break, and we have a hard start at uh, at 10:30. I do have to make one comment. This has been a terrific panel. Thank you, Steve and panelists. Uh, on the comment about Constitution, we need a we need a vast majority of Americans. Already, polls show consistently that more than 70 percent of Americans want this. So whether it's just 270 electoral votes or not, which is what we need to elect a president, seems like there are a lot of people who want this. And I don't think this would necessarily be so counter to what Americans believe. Are you suggesting that one could trip the other? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But uh, great panel. Thank you. Ready?